Can you remember uh, your gateway into horror movies or movies in general? Well, um, yeah, I mean, horror. I was six years old when I got cast as Norman Bates uh, in Cycle 4, so I was introduced pretty early um, in that regard, but I didn't know, you know, I was young, I was sheltered, uh, I didn't know what horror was. Uh, getting into acting in general. I got into acting when I was three years old. So that, as a child, you don't really know what acting is. It's kind of like uh, lying. That's how you associate mm-hmm. it. You're just not telling the truth. And it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But um, when I was on a horror set, it was like, this isn't real. You know, this is, everybody was super nice because I was a child. But that was my first introduction to this world of horror. And because of it, I got really obsessed. Not only was I a crazy movie buff, but really into horror itself. So it, about that age was kind of like when it was introduced, but, but the first time I was ever terrified out of my mind was a Tales from the Crypt episode. And I was real young and my dad showed me. He was like, yeah, it's fine. Some, some haunted house episode. And, and it was the scariest thing. Like to this day, like I put myself in situations to get scared you know to feel uh-huh. that rush yeah. and nothing gets my blood going like that tales from the crypt theme music like that just yeah. gets me back yeah I time travel that. and i'm like oh, oh, my heart starts going and i'm like oh my god and it's all from the instance when i was a kid and i was real young and that um i guess that actually made me quite scared of of scary things right that's the point but no then i got quite uh, after that after the movie was and I realized what it was and I was able to see my scenes. I never could see the whole movie until I was older, but, uh, and then I got obsessed with horror uh, and I would make the lists. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of people did that of every single series, check them off. Uh, the very end of blockbuster days, they had a thing where if you watched the movie, you could go return it and get another movie, mm-hmm. almost like the original Netflix. And, uh, and I took advantage of that. You know, I'd watch the same day, come back and he's like, you just watched it. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Next, you know, so I just became uh, obsessed and yeah, I, I, uh, that would probably be my first introduction pretty, pretty early. I'd say six is pretty young. Yeah. And, and how did that, um, how did that all come about for you? Like at, at six, I suppose now for somebody, you know, like myself or a lot of people that would listen to the show, um, to think that at the age of six, you were starring in what a lot of people regard as one of the only movies worthwhile other than the original Psycho. Uh, Part 4 gets so much love to, like, how do you end up in a movie like that? In that that situation, yeah, yeah. So actually, like, so I was six when I got cast in Psycho, but I started acting at three years old. And it wasn't uh, something my parents did. My mother had a childhood friend at the time, and her daughter was going into modeling and acting, and uh, she had to babysit me. So I went with them to the, the talent agency, and um the girl was a little shy. She was hiding behind her mom and I was uh, a lot more outgoing and she kind of fell, fell in love with me and was like, I I want his contact info. Um, and my mom and I had just moved to Florida and my dad, you know, so it was all new. She's like, we can't afford, um, resumes. We can't do this or that. She's like, I'll take care of, of, of it in the beginning. Don't worry. I just, I just want to put him in this. And I did in a few uh, weeks later, I got my first job, which was, um, it was a commercial for Wet n Wild, and Wet n Wild was in Orlando, Florida, mm-hmm. uh, water theme park, and uh, and it started from there. And then I was a super adorable kid. Uh, it was way before this nose grew into what it is today, and uh, and it was it just started taking off. And I had managers and uh, agents, and um, uh, and I would go to New York for for the entire summer. It was a very weird childhood. Uh, that's for sure. But that's yeah, I got into it accidentally, so to speak. It was never, you know. Yeah. And and at the time, um, you know, while all this is going on in your life, do you really, is it just now looking back on it, you find it like, you know, geez, that was, that was a bit of a strange time in life. No, or no. did you know at the time or did it just seem like, oh, look, it's whatever. No, at the time it felt normal, like, cause that's the only thing I knew. I didn't really feel like I was working, so to speak, yeah. but I didn't really realize how much it messed me up. Um, in the sense of like way, like when you're a child actor, you're judged constantly, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like for your looks, your height, you know, you don't really understand what rejection is 
because you know your mom's like oh, you love you you're perfect the way you are yeah, yeah, I love yeah, your yeah. Face. and then they're like no 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 i don't like your eye color and you're just like ah, i had to process that as a kid is really hard um and you realize like i always had my mother my father or my manager or my agent introduce me um they were the ones that like started conversation like I, did, I had to relearn how to talk to people uh i had to relearn later in life how to to do what i wanted to do because when you're three years old you don't go into mm-hmm. acting like this is my passion this is my drive yeah, this is what yeah. i love <laughs> like you don't know any of that stuff you know you're just a kid and i was really obedient i did what i was told you know and that was the thing that worked um I was able to to smile on cue, could do whatever I wanted, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot that goes into it, but you don't realize it until you're older. Yeah, you know, and then yeah. when you're reflecting and lots of therapy, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll probably we'll probably get back into it at some point um, in the next few minutes. The whole process of Psycho Four, um, sure, sure, but. So after that point, uh, after Psycho 4, um, w- what happened from there? Because I suppose everybody would, would see that as like, um, well, at least now, maybe not at the time, but now it's like, oh, you know, that would be like a pinnacle for a lot of people. Oh, it was at the time. It was way bigger at the time in the sense of like um, Joseph Safado had came back to write it and he wrote the original Psycho, mm-hmm. so that was a big deal. Um, part 3 didn't do that well theatrically, so they weren't sure what to do with four at the time. And it was released in some theaters, but it was the showtime was the big deal. So Mm -hmm. um, at the time it was neat and new and fresh and it, it it was huge. And everyone knew who Norman Bates was in the sense of like psycho was one of the biggest things, you know, and uh, it got to the point where I was really, uh, I never told anybody. I was really like, when people found out, I would just kind of hide. I wouldn't let them, I don't know. It was a weird thing, but it was a big deal when they knew like the minute they found out I would watch people change. And that was the hard part as a child because somebody wasn't really into you. Maybe they weren't really talking to you. They find out you're a child actor in a relatively successful franchise. Then all of a sudden they would just change and be like your best friend. It was this fakeness that mm. I, 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 so I would never let people know about wh- what I did and my achievements because until after they were my friend. It was almost like a bonus. It wasn't like, yeah. uh, because it was hard to find people that liked me for me. And I didn't even know who I was because I was always playing. I was acting. And like I said, at three years old, when you learn to lie, you essentially become a people pleaser, which is exactly what I became. I was an adapter. I found out really young that if you want everyone to like you, all you have to do is agree with them. And I knew that if it, it could be anybody, it could be some, it could be the craziest scenario. He's like, oh, hey man, I like to murder people. And I'm like, yeah, me too. And they're like, hey, I like this guy. You know, it was yeah, anything yeah. relatable. You, so I would like never share my opinion. It would always be whatever yours is. I run to the other side and, and, and play both sides deal. And like, because I was terrified of not being liked. And that what came from the rejection of, of, of child acting was, you know, and, and when people found out that I was an actor at school, I didn't know how to take that meaning some people would whisper behind my back and point at me. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were talking probably cause they heard that I was in a movie or commercials or TV shows and stuff. But I took it as like, they, they think I'm ugly. They're making fun of me. Like I didn't know, like it just didn't make sense. And that really made me a person where I'm super outgoing and I love to talk. But if you met anyone through my high school, they would thought I was a shy person and quiet. And uh, normally, you know how there's like fight or flight response. Mm-hmm. There's also freeze. And I was the freeze where like I would adapt to my environment and look around and, and start to shape shift into whatever their views were. So they would like me. And it was a horrible way because you, I was acting all the time. I was constantly acting and, uh, and the minute, so it was a huge deal and I never told anybody it's time. It was just the big thing. And then it was about like 2013, uh, these, uh, younger couple I had met, and they were huge horror buffs. And I was like, oh, you know, and I, I, I hate, I don't like being a bragger of any sort. And I feel really uh, kind of ashamed when I bring it up. But I thought it would be fun for people that are interested in horror to know. I'd be mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, I, I played this part. Uh, and they were like, what was it? I said, oh, Psycho 4. And they're like, I don't know. What is that? And I'm like, oh, you know, Alfred Hitchcock, the original Psycho. No, I don't, we don't know what that is. 
uh, yeah, okay, black and white shower scene. Ree, ree, ree. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I remember that. And it meant nothing anymore. And then I was like, wow, it's totally changed. Now it's like, oh, you were in the third sequel of an original movie. And I was like, yeah, yeah, part four at the beginning. N- nothing. Like, uh, so once that happened, I felt so much better in a way where I could be myself and not. Um, yeah, it kind didn't of have to be a be- thing. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but so going through that, I had um, got to a point where it, the lowest point of my life where I hit rock bottom. And um, it was then when I decided to kind of pull myself out of where I was in life in, in the sense of uh, the pursuit of happiness. And uh, yeah. And and so so part of that was I cared way too much about what people think. That was my whole thing was what everybody thinks. And so I was, I, I was in a very toxic relationship at the time. I, I avoided everybody. I was isolated. Um, I had been reached out in 2007, Jason, uh, I forgot his name, but he reached out to me and wanted to do a podcast for cycle four. It was still a thing. And they were doing a documentary movie and all this stuff at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was terrified of showing that I wasn't this, successful child actor where I wasn't the, cause that's what everyone told you when you were a kid, especially in 1990, they're like, you're the next Macaulay Culkin. You know, they're, they just overdo it. So if you didn't even achieve half what they thought you felt like a loser. Yeah. And for a very long time, I avoided everyone and family friends like tried my hardest to, because they thought I, they, cause every time they talked to me, Hey, what are you doing next? And, and I felt like I had to be somewhere in life that I wasn't. So, I wouldn't do any podcasts. Um, I had them, they wanted to do those festivals, you know, the, the comic cons. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, no, because then people would say, well, what are you doing now? And at the time I was doing a mortgage job and, and this was like, you know, 2007. So it was quite a while ago and, and I wouldn't do anything. So this is my first podcast because uh, I'm all about now. Now this is about six years ago is when I started the pursuit of Ryan, you know, inner finding me. Uh, and, now it's like, why not? If anybody sheds a tiny bit of interest in horror, man, that is fun and great. And I love to talk of my experiences and what I'm doing now and all sorts of stuff. So uh, now in my life, uh, it's, you know, life is full of terrible things. It's the in-between mm-hmm. moments that count, right? It's all, it's always going to be bad things, but preparing for the next one. So now it's, it's living in the moment, mindfulness and working on, on comedy. And, and I still love horror, uh, uh, but now finding people that enjoy it's really cool and connecting with them and and i hear really neat stories from my movie which is just nuts you wouldn't think psycho four would have puts uh something in people's hearts but it did for the people that couldn't afford a horror movie but had showtime so i heard a lot of stories of that it was their first horror film that they saw and i'm just like wow you know that's neat (laughs) like yeah i could totally see that and and it's something i i think i've brought up before um about uh, i would put psycho 4 in my category of what i like to call comfort movies so and and see and at one point i i could kind of um it was something i would try and hide from people that i had like really yeah like that something not, not necessarily my love for horror but the fact that um you know being in bad places in life and different things like that and then i could put on a movie like that and just kind of escape for a while and sort of forget about everything. And it, to me, I was kind of ashamed of that. I was like, that seems really maybe pathetic or sad that I would use movies to like escape from reality. And just like it, it kind of feeds in, I guess, to what you were saying. With like, I I think a movie like this and and you know lots of different pieces of work can affect people in like such vast ways. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I agree with you. I think we're in a really neat time in life where in the nineties, uh, I was obsessed with, with movies as well and horror. And I felt the exact same way. It was a way to escape reality. Uh, not only leave your problems, but maybe appreciate them more when the movie's over. Oh, wow. I'm not getting murdered. That's pretty, you know, whatever. Um, I would go, it was a therapeutic experience and I felt like I learned a ton of life lessons through movies that I did not get to learn in real life Mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, but I did think I was the only one that thought that. And I also didn't really tell people would think I was a loser. Oh, wait, you spent the weekend seeing movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I collected all my stubs. I still have them all. I still, to this day, um, That's 1996 amazing. is when I started 
and I have thousands and thousands of movie stubs. And, uh, and now I sound like the old man when I go to, to a movie theater and they're like, you can just go in, just it's scannable. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I collect them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're like, ah. <laughs> that's me. Uh, I'm like, and I have to be that dude. Um, can, can I, talk to your manager i'm so sorry because they'll do the thing oh and we're all out of printer ink this whole stuff because it's such a big deal yeah, i yeah. guess and i'm like ah. and now i got this like preservable ink spray stuff for ticket stubs because they're all so yeah it doesn't um the heat transfer or whatever yeah well it's like back in the day a stub was a was a memory it was like mm-hmm. a it was awesome it never faded it was now yep. it's this little piece of receipt that starts going in three days and, yeah, uh, I definitely feel that. I I actually done that most recently with Halloween Kills. Um, like everybody's going in, scanning their phones, and obviously, over here we have the whole vaccination thing, and you've got to show it, and people are scanning their phones. And then I go to the counter, and I'm like, "Can I get a printout?" And he's like, "No, you can just." I was like, "Yeah, no, I just want to." He's like, "Wait, what? What's going on?" I was yeah, like, I just I just want to get know. the tickets. Just can I? He's like, it's horrible. And Halloween was one kills as well. Cause I had seen H2O. There was a re-release, the two Rob zombies and, and these, so I had them. So that was a special one. I really wanted the kills ticket stub. Uh, and, and yeah, I had to fight for that one too. <laughs> if they don't have like those dispensers, you know, those little like yeah. kiosks you can yeah. scan. Um, uh, 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 I love those more, but it's, you know, a struggle, man. And like my, I have a couple series that are like near and dear to my heart, uh, ticket stub wise in the sense of like the, my all time favorite horror series would be saw, uh, in the sense of like, I saw it opening night without knowing anything back in the, you know, oh, it was wow. universal theater. So, Oh, it's on my Instagram actually like down there. I, cause I, I want to start posting my movie stubs for the other people that would find mm-hmm. them neat. Uh, cause I was kind of ashamed, you know, about collecting them, but now it's, it's interesting. But if you, on the Instagram, if you go down, you'll see every single one I saw opening day, and that was my series that, like, I f- obsess at. Like, I just can't wait because I think uh, the narrative is amazing. The fact they flow, it feels like an ongoing series as opposed to just, like, torture porn. Mm-hmm. It's it's So that one's near and dear to my heart. That and the Scream series was really big when I was a kid and uh, growing up. So that one, I can't wait for, for five and uh, and those stubs. So Yeah, I was just, um, <laughs> just looking at the... The screenshot here i love when people have a story like this because i feel like that as well like i collect so many like things that i would consider bizarre to like the common person or whatever and i'm like well, i don't really want to be like i said i got this weird like i i feel like I'm, I'm getting to the point where i'm uh getting better with you know not worrying about what everyone thinks and this guy is like laughing at me or they think i'm this or they think i'm that but even like the vibe the guy gave me when he was like i don't understand what you mean i'm like I just want to get the the ticket, and he was like, "No, it's fine. You don't need it." I was like, "Yeah, no, I I kind of do." And he's like, "Okay." And he just he gives me this That's look, I and then I kind of yeah, I feel weird. Then I'm like, <laughs> I hope "Nobody else is listening." Oh yeah, gosh. I mean, it's yeah, it's a little embarrassing, but um, and now it's neat. People are like, mm. "Wow, you got all these ticket stubs," and and I'm the nerd that's literally putting them in an Excel spreadsheet now because I have so many. I put them in categories and. Uh, you know, uh, it's that's amazing. Still love, and but. and I will say that um, and it might it might sound overly ridiculous, but I actually think it would be a thing. I've seen people like uh, scan them onto like pages or whatever. You know, like you see people put together a book of like um, mm-hmm. there's there's um, I can't remember the guy's name. Ad nauseum is the name of the book. He had cut out all the newspaper um prints for horror movies over the years. <laughs> And then he yeah, scanned them all those. into, yeah, scanned them into like this huge book. And like that thing, look, I bought them all. And like so many other people were like, oh, this is like badass. I, I would cut out the newspapers. I have so much stuff. So one of the things I'm working on that I've been working on for a couple of years is a, it's a passion project of mine. And it's a, um, a movie, <clears throat> excuse me, based on my life. But uh, I've been videotaping my whole life, right? So when I got into acting at three, I got obsessed with the camera. And more so behind the scenes because when you're a, an actor – more likely a child actor, you're told what to do and you think, oh, I could do something else and you really want to be in control, right? So later I learned that that me having some type of control in my life is what I was lacking because everybody had control. Um, and sorry, uh, so since I was a kid, um, I, I was obsessed with behind the scenes and meaning control. So my parents had a camera and I videotaped everything from that age on uh, and it's like obsessively disgusting. It's It's gross. There's so much home video footage and it's not just 
video footage, it's actually really funny stuff. And it's not just, oh, my family's funny. Look at my slideshows. It's like I laugh so hard uh, and how I was able to capture almost my whole life and see exactly where things went wrong, like mentally, Mm -hmm. like, oh, that screwed me up there and be able to backtrack. A lot of people can't do that. Or they'll reflect on a memory and, and think differently of it until they see it. But I actually have video evidence for all of my stories. And uh, I, I do a, a stand-up comedy, and I was telling a bunch of them. And, and the difference between my stand-up and, their, and other people's is that I can actually show the video of what I'm talking about in the sense of that it actually happened. So I was just sitting on all this footage, and, and family members are getting older and passing away and things. And I'm like, this makes me laugh. And... I am a big believer of, of sharing what you find funny. And mm-hmm. it's, a, it's because others will find it funny, you know? And that's the whole thing is finding our tribe. We think we're outcasts and weirdos, going to movies all the time, collecting stubs, but then you realize there's a lot of people doing it. We're not so weird. We find our people. We realize, wow, you know, I got a family out there I didn't even know about. Um, and that, so, yeah, finding your tribe is kind of the main goal now. But um, – Part of it is also I get really excited and my mind's all over the place. So mind me too. I jump, I jump around because uh, first podcast, I'm excited, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm, <laughs> I, you're making me excited just seeing how passionate you are about things that you're into. So as regards uh, th- this movie you're trying to put together then, um, I guess in, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but uh, what is your vision for the project? Like um, if you were to see a, a finished product, what exactly does it look like? So it's, um, I really like horror films with twists, right? Like Saw and have the Ender, right? I don't think there's enough of them in comedies um, in the sense of that when you rewatch the entire movie, it's completely different from the ending. Mm -hmm. And this has that particular twist um, without going too much into it. um, it, uh, If I were to, it would just kind of ruin the whole thing. But the main thing is pretty much the, rise and fall of an individual and to see that when uh hitting rock bottom is the best thing that could have happened to me and you know i was living in my car with my dog at one point because my ego gets me like i just was in a really bad spot and i sat there and i'm like well what's stopping me of my happiness and and i said well i love editing i've been editing over 20 years i uh was in final cut pro and i didn't know much about adobe so i said what can i do to do i went to classes in washington dc and i got certified in premiere pro and then i bought a new computer and then i started re- reaching out to my old contacts and started getting gigs and redoing what i love and that was that was um making other people smile and laugh and that's where like i do stand up for me i don't like doing it no fame or fortune i was young when I kind of got a taste of that and it wasn't really something I enjoyed. Now, if I can change the chemicals in your brain by the words coming out of my mouth or my actions and make you feel better, like that is the friggin' best in the world, best feeling. So, so when I get up there and I share these stories, I'm, I'm looking for the people that are going to find them as funny as I do, because, because if I find it funny, they will too. And if they don't, that's okay. You don't care what people think anymore. Right. That's the Mm -hmm. whole thing. It's like going on stage is probably the most vulnerable you can be. That's the most, when I was growing up, I never, ever would have done that in my mind i was like i would never go on stage then everyone's judging you that was my thing being judged but now it's like no 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 i'm searching i'm no long i'm broadcasting my voice and and hopefully i make enough noise somebody will hear it that gets it and they're like let's let's do it let's have a you know it's all about that now and and my job now uh, uh, is great and uh and it, it gave me an outlet to a ton of people that are similar, uh, like-minded, and they're also helping me with this movie. And le- and my whole thing is the only people I want working on this film with me, and, and it's an ever-going process, are people that are doing it for the love and the fun. Yeah. And it's not about fame or fortune. And I want to pay them all the money they deserve. And I will do a Kickstarter when it's ready and, the, and it will all be spelled out of what that money really goes to. And it's mainly like IP and intellectual property stuff. A lot of things I was in um, getting the rights to is very expensive. And mm-hmm. if I'm not able to use it, I'm going to reenact it as an adult, which would just be funnier in itself. So it's kind of like those things. Um, but it, at the end of the day, I already know, I already got the, the way it's going to go out, but just to be in a theater with close friends or family or just people in general and being able to show uh, this, I like, I can't wait, but it's, 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 uh, one of those things. It's the passion project, right? So it's always on the sidelines in the sense of it's, it's for fun. You do it when, when you're in a great mood, you don't want to go and feel like it's work yeah. and that, uh, and I'm, I'm originally it was going to be this, you know, obviously the pandemic through everything, uh, 
into the into the river but um next year i really hope to get filming the good stuff and um and then once i get like kind of a, a great little project together um i'm gonna just start overdoing everything right now i try to avoid social media in the sense of comparing yourself to others yeah but uh once i get this all going you know i'll i'll be out there i have it all ready but when I'm ready to launch, it's it's that, and I can't wait to just share my funny. And there'll be so much other stuff, other projects are coming out, and something next year that's going to air. Um, I can't talk about. It. I signed one of those disclosure things, but uh, it's going to be so funny. Uh, it's yeah, uh, it's silly, but yeah, it's going to be great, man. So that's my whole thing now is like conquering your fear, right? So I was afraid of doing podcasts. Why? Because I was afraid you're going to ask me, and I'm going to have to tell you I hit rock bottom. Right. So now I, 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 maybe I can help people. I don't care, but this was that thing when you reached out and it was in my DMS, like, you know, it was like a spam kind of thing. It was hidden mm -hmm. and I found it and I was like, why not? I mean, this is silly. This is silly not to talk about it and it will be a little fun. So my whole outlook now is, uh, Will Smith had kind of talked about this, but it's very similar, uh, skydiving you, uh, the initial thought you, you lose sleep over it the night before, you jump and that's that crazy adrenaline like, whoo, and then he pulls the chute and it stops and it's pure quiet. It's beautiful. It's bliss. And that is the, on the other side of fear is, is, is a new experience and you find out who you are a better version. And, and I put myself through weird, crazy stuff that terrifies me and just to see what comes out on the other end. And, and nine times out of 10, it's always been uh, quite an awesome experience. So it's all about helping others now. Yeah, I love that. And I definitely think you will. And I appreciate you being so um, so open about it. Um, and like I said, anything you don't want to talk about, it's completely fine. I just did want to touch on something. Obviously, you mentioned um, about hitting rock bottom. And at one point, you know, you'd lived in your car and stuff like that. And when you started to analyze, you know, what was maybe making you unhappy or what, what had you in in this situation mentally and stuff like that. How did you, because I think so many people deal with that, um, and a lot of people never get themselves out of that position. Maybe, uh, and I know for me personally as well, I've been in similar situation, and it was ongoing for many years, and it's it's taken me until kind of now to really get a little bit of a grasp on it. I think a lot of times it comes from not, maybe not wanting to look at certain aspects or not wanting to really analyze. But what would you say is something you could put your finger on as to what was the catalyst in helping you, you know, go from this completely rock bottom to trying to get things back? Well, you feel quite abandoned. And when you hit certain spots in life, you always think friends and family will be there for you and my friends and family are very awesome and great and you know it's grateful but it you realize that like everybody has a life and they only kind of help you when you need it and then when the phone is over they live their life you know and and going through that kind of experience realizing you are in control of your life if you're unhappy it's up to you to make it happy and figure out what you can do along the ways and part of it is being vulnerable and open and and the only way to get to not caring what people think is to speak your mind and then you will find those that, that are willing to listen. And probably the hardest thing when I meet people in general is for them to look inside and of themselves, you know, and find out what is wrong. And because then you have to admit defeat. No one likes saying or admit fault and no one likes to say they have faults. And yeah. we live in a day and age where you show the highlight reel on Facebook and not the behind the scenes. And then you, you know, so it, I think you don't really know until you hit it. And when you do, life just completely changes. It, it's where I was following this. Like I said, I, I was obedient. I followed the rules. Life was about meeting someone, getting married, get a house, white picket fence, get the dog. Life's good. You know, I did that stuff and life was horrible. And I thought I was um, doing it for society's rules, the, the, uh, dream of what life should be. Yeah. And when you got there, I was the most unhappy I'd ever been. And, uh, so it, it's more about surrounding yourself with people that are your cheerleaders and you're their cheerleaders. It's, it's about uplifting each other and helping. And 
surrounding yourself with the right ones. And I, I unfortunately had a bunch of people I shouldn't have hung out with when I was younger. And had I really surrounded myself with like-minded individuals, it would have went a lot better. Um, but again, I was, I was scared. I didn't know. I didn't, I really thought I, I was pretty um, mentally good until I realized that I wasn't at all, you know, it was, yeah. It was, yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, refining yourself um and and yeah and and kind of to i guess uh piggyback off of that um obviously you know you've mentioned about the the movie and different things that you're super passionate about how do you um i I find personally and a lot of people have actually reached out and said they're in a similar position i feel like when you're creative in any way or you want to create something or you know, do something within a field that's maybe not as mainstream or whatever. Like you want to do your own thing. You've got passions, you've got hobbies, you've got things you want to focus on. How do you stop yourself from um, driving yourself crazy with, how could I give an example? Like I could do 20 podcasts every single day for an entire year and still feel like I hadn't done enough. I hadn't spoken to enough people, got enough opinions and different, you know, tips and advice and, um, it helps to write it all down because it's like the grass is always green, greener syndrome to where it's like, oh, even if I did this, it's not good enough yet till I do this. You know, a lot of major celebrities have mm-hmm. that same thing where it's like, I did all these movies. They're like, it's not enough. Got to do the next thing. And it's more about realizing that what you have achieved are goals and they're, and they're great. You know, um, doing a podcast a week is something that I would love to do and it is, requires work. And you know, it's not an easy thing in the sense of there's st- effort that goes into it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people forget that. Um, so, you know, um, so I, I was trying to think of some other stuff to go with, but there's, yeah. there's something, there's something else before we get off this topic, there was something else that mm-hmm. I wanted to ask as well. To hear you talk about, um, you know, feeling maybe the way you felt for a period of time and being in a situation where you just weren't, you know, mentally good. To go from that to seeing the person, obviously anyone listening to this won't be able to see you, but I think they'll know just from your your tone and your voice alone. You seem like somebody who is, had you never have mentioned any of this, I would have said like, you know, this guy hasn't had a sad day or a bad day or an upsetting day in his life. He's like super positive, super, you know, go get him, good energy. How is that something that you had to like curate over years to try and get yourself there? Or was that one of those things you feel was always maybe under the surface and you just needed to kind of. Yeah, no, it was always there um, in the sense of people would be like, um, Ryan's never serious, you know, that, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. It's very much like Robin Williams. We were, we're mask, um, when we're sad, we don't like others being sad. We, we would like to make people feel good. And, uh, it's, it, you know, it's one of those yeah, kind of things where it, I, I like, if we're talking right now and I just met you, I'd much rather put you in a good mood and boost you up and make you feel good. Maybe give advice, get some advice as well, rather than be a dopey dope and talk about, mm. you know, really sad stuff. Um, but I, I had always been that way where, where it almost felt like my feelings weren't valid, where it was like, Oh, Ryan, you can't be sad. You're a funny guy. You're positive, you know? Mm -hmm. But then I realized, well, you know, I got feelings like everyone else. That's okay. And I did put a mask on. I was always the one to try to make people feel better because I just knew how horrible it felt to be an outcast of some form. And, and I was also ridiculed when I would try to complain. So I would shut up, meaning, which I get now, you know, as a kid, if you're complaining, like, um, I would complain about things where it was like, oh, what'd you do for summer? Uh, I went to a swimming camp and they would be like, well, that's cool. And then I'm like, yeah, but it was, you know, for synchronized swimming. I had to learn because like when you're a child actor, you got to get all these little uh, achievements on your resume of Mm -hmm. things you can do. So like when people were going to uh, learn how to swim, I was learning synchronized swimming. And it was like, yeah. when's that going to come in handy in life? Like a shark's chasing me and I have to run away with like elegance and flexibility. You know what I mean? Like it's, it was, it was, so when I would complain about certain things where I couldn't do it, I can't dye my hair. I couldn't get a haircut. I couldn't get tattoo. I couldn't alter. I couldn't get a tan or a sunburn. Uh, that's not something you complain about. People got real life, you know? So I always felt like my feelings were invalid to be like, oh, I'm getting judged. I can't do this. So like, yeah, right, dude. You know, uh, mm-hmm. 
you, you, you're crying, you're a child actor, you baby, you're doing people's dreams. And I'm like, uh, but they're not mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. so I just would shut up and not say a damn word and had to learn, you know, again, who I was later. Yeah. Um, um, you're, am I right in saying you're big into your fitness? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big time, which yeah, on my Instagram, you can see a little bit, uh, I have crazy body dysmorphia, which is another thing I'm trying to slowly get over is where I just kind of see myself as this huge dude all the time. And, uh, yeah, in 2017, um, was very close to that dark, darkest period. Mm -hmm. And I was the heaviest I had been. And I went up to visit my mom in South Carolina for mother's day. And she does Zumba at her gym. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Ryan, you got to do Zumba. You got to love it. You got to love it. And I'm like, no, I'm not dancing working. That's ridiculous. That's silly. And she's like, please, it's mother's day. Just do one. And I'm like, Oh my God. All right, fine. And I went to this Zumba thing and every other song, I'm literally <laughs> holding my ribs, sitting on, like against mm -hmm. the, the wall. Every other song. And I'm like, this is a real workout. Like if I can just, lose some weight by dancing goofy wise this is fine so i did it twice a week and then i realized well maybe i can and this is that whole thing of putting yourself in uncomfortable positions and it was like zoo i was the only dude for a year and a half and in zumba and then i started implementing weight holding one pounds two pounds three pounds because that made me feel more kind of like not like when they would do like kind of sexy moves i had the weights in my hand so it did i didn't have to do that mm -hmm. i didn't feel uncomfortable you know i literally would sit in my car and and psych myself up. And I'm like, just go in, man. It's just Zoom, but you just do, you know, cause I felt so like, I'm not good at all, but it's, 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 first of all, I laugh it's so much at myself in the mirror, but you find out the majority of everyone else are looking at themselves. They don't care about you. They're all insecure yeah. and, you know, as well. Um, so that led to doing Pilates, which led to doing yoga, which led to doing upper body, which led to doing running. And then I got into uh, just, yeah. So I try working out about two hours every day and, uh, doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So I'm crazy in fitness now and I would have never, ever thought I would be. Yeah. It's prior to that. Dude, it's so funny to hear you say something like that. Cause, um, maybe, maybe not to the same degree because, uh, if anyone does check out, um, Ryan's Instagram or whatever, dude, you like, <laughs> that's like one of those like crazy, like miracle kind of transformation things. And I don't mean that you look that bad at the start, but no, the, the the end result is like something that I don't, like. I, I've got to say, fair play. That's like crazy, crazy dedication. Well, thank you very much for saying that. that's very, very nice. And I, I don't, you know, part of the acting thing was like people would tell you stuff to kiss your ass. So for me, it's hard to take comment, and mm -hmm. I actually trust strangers like you more so because mm -hmm. than friends or family saying that. So it makes me feel good, and thank you for saying that. I posted it because my, my therapist was like, Ryan, you'll see, cause you're, it's hard to see that you actually have it even. And th that's super nice to hear that, that you, you could see a, a change. I almost couldn't myself. And I had to like retrain my brain to look at shadows. I know this is kind of weird, but like shadows and then like your bicep will yeah. form a muscle and you're like, Oh, that's a shadow I never saw. And then your mind will try to flip it and be like, you're getting fatter. And you're like, no, 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 no. no. Uh, and so it just took a tremendous amount of, uh, post-it notes and like I got on my wall three categories my goals that I'm doing uh, uh working out and just better Ryan just different things to to do and uh it is the hardest thing it's never fun it never got easy and that was part of it is just constantly challenging yourself and I read David Goggins book and I don't know if you yes. if you read that yeah oh my gosh that then that put me into a whole nother gear of just like wow my body is only hit 40 percent and I'm like ah I know then I, I took it to another level and, but that's because I kind of went through this time where I was like, I'll be alone forever. It's it, it, so when you're in a rational state of mind, it's hard to think rationally. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'd be like, well, I'm alone forever. I'm never, I, cause I couldn't trust women anymore in, in the sense of, you know, when you're hurt and I was like, well, you know, at this point in my life too old, I don't think I'm going to find anyone. You know, you start saying those things and you're mm -hmm. like, I just, I don't want to die though early. What can I do? Oh, okay. I'll work out. So I started getting that. Well, I want to live. I don't want to look good. I don't, it's not for show at all. I'm like, what can I do to live a long life by myself? And, and even doing uh, weird exercises like falling, like trying to fall over and over of how you would fall as an elderly person. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'm just trying to extend my life thinking 
I won't be able to find somebody, but you know, that's silly. Eventually I will, but right now uh, I'm single by choice. And that's because uh, I'm a romantic. I fall in love like real fast in the sense of I will put you first, which you should do, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, I will like get distracted very easily and right, and and he, all for the wrong reasons, in the sense of like, I'll be like, I just want to, I'll, I'll seek that missing hole in my heart. I think that will be the answer when, in reality, it isn't. Uh, that comes no matter what. So once I get this movie, I'm put because I put so much effort and hours into it and my real job uh, that I just don't have time right now. And in a relationship, you should give a hundred percent, but you should at least give fifty. And I barely can give twenty five to me, mm-hmm. you know. And so there's unfortunately not, but that doesn't mean. Um, that I'm not like lonely, but that's when you realize that um, solitude is not loneliness and you realize they're quite different and that being solid, being by yourself is actually great and therapeutic. And then you find out it's one of the hardest things for people to do is to be by them. Some people to be by themselves because then you start thinking, then you start questioning and then you're like, you're not distracting your mind with all this other stuff, you know? Yeah, I I definitely, and I think uh, what you've just said there will probably resonate and help a lot of people. I definitely, uh, up until the start of the pandemic, I had basically lived my entire life off of what you have just said. Um, I would seek something in somebody else all the time. Um, This missing thing, I would chase it, I would drop absolutely everything. Um, And just, and it was never, I used to always blame the other person. I was like, oh, I've done everything for you. And it's like, this was something that I was actively doing to me and, and I just repeated the cycle. And I remember it actually happened right at the start of the pandemic here in Ireland where um, I'd been in a relationship for quite a few years and it just kind of ended right at the end of the pandemic. Uh, I lost yeah. my job. We lost the house. And it was like all this stuff. And and, and at, at that point, like not even being tardy, I was like, life's over i'm never going to meet anyone again i don't even want to meet anyone again but i also feel sorry for myself and i'm this and i'm that and and i just kind of kept going through all that and i i really think that and i know a lot of awful things have happened in the last two years but it was probably definitely the best thing that has happened to me is kind of because i I could sit here now and, and and safely say that had the pandemic have not have forced me into that kind of solitude and really looking at myself and what it was that I really enjoyed and wanted to do and being happy and and what I was lacking and whatever I don't think I would have done it I was just kind of put no, into no. a position where I had no choice and I I don't know if I if I would have been able to get to a position like you like where you had that strength to go right okay this is what I need to have a look at this is what I want to do this is like it takes a and and I know a lot of people won't won't say it outright because like you said everyone tries to like you know put their best foot forward online and whatever um sure but i i think so many people do that where they just like you said they just kind of live by the rules and just kind of oh yeah white picket fence and you know they get in an unhealthy relationship and just kind of put up with it and and they bring kids into yeah, the world. Yeah, it's just kind it's of just like, creature habit, doing the easy stuff, uh, the the simplest bliss, you know, and, and, and not – it's a good feeling. People like to feel good, you know. Yeah. And when you change that, it's not a good feeling, and then people want to go back to what makes them feel good, mm-hmm. and that can be a bad thing. And I almost felt like during the pandemic I was like – everyone else got to feel the way I was feeling years before because I was isolated. I was alone. I wasn't talking to anyone. And – um, I thrived in the pandemic in the sense of um, I I was already in that mentality, but now the distractions were almost less. You know, yeah. you could, I couldn't go to the movies. That was my gateway. Uh, uh, here, you know, I don't know in Ireland, but like we have Regal Unlimited. So you pay a monthly fee. Mm-hmm. You can see as many movies in theaters, right? So when the pandemic first happened, I was doing that in the very beginning. I'm like, I'll spend day all movies. And then when they took that from me, that was my distraction. And while I was still trying to always figure out what's distracting me, yeah, and you're forced, like you said, to look inside because you, all of your vices are yeah. boredom. After a while, you're like, well, there's nothing to watch. There's nothing, all I can do now is think. Unless you're doing something to escape that drinking, smoking, something to get away from that. And then you realize a lot of the times it's just the beginning thing. You sit there. You wonder what's wrong with me. You find out or maybe not. You keep thinking. You cry. You get through it. And then you keep going. It just feels at the moment that there, there's no way over this. And that's the darkest moment. And, and I got to a point of 
uh, suicidal, you know, and this was, mm-hmm. like I said, it's about six years ago to where you got to the darkest of the dark. And I was a person that was very anti that growing up. I was always a big person of never, why would you ever do that? You know, you can kind of get, you know, kind of th- I could never understand why somebody would get to that mindset. And then I was in a very toxic relationship uh, for many years and she ended up trying to take her life in front of me and it was over, over silly stuff. And it was such, and she had a lot, a lot of things to go through, but it was then that I realized that, you know, uh, sorry, like bringing this stuff up is kind no. of like just conjuring up all, it's almost talking exactly what I'm, what I'm, te- you don't want to, you want to run away from these things. You want to kind of figure out why they're there. And sometimes you don't know why, but once you get through the emotions and you get over that little part, you can almost feel like it's really not that bad. Even if it's terrible, it's not that bad because, because tomorrow's another day. And, and I, I hate talking like that, but it's the truth. It's just like time heals everything. And, um, and talk, talk to people. Don't feel like you're alone. That's how I felt. And, that, and that's probably the hardest thing to get through people's mind is that you're going to feel alone and that no one understands you and that no one will. But that's not true because others are feeling that way. Mm-hmm. But it's it, you have to get through it. Just never, ever get to that point. It, it just it, it was um, something that once I realized I could get to that mindset, too, that anyone could because I was so anti that those thought patterns. And and if you get into that horrible spot you're not alone and taking your life it, it, it's it, it feels like that's the answer because pain stops is what what you feel but that's not true life stops everything stops and that's when you realize life is pain and we go back to what i was saying there will always be pain there'll be a death ad will happen it's those in-between moments keep yourself sane and, and it takes practice just like working out a muscle you can't curl 20 pounds and then you're jacked like the rock the next yeah, day yeah. it's the same thing with mental you put up those post-it notes but do things self-reflect wake up every day if it, if it do it it sounds cheesy and silly but it's the truth because you don't have that other person in your life to tell you those things and we aren't going to believe ourselves because if we could none of us would have problems mm-hmm. so it's like you know, getting through it and also remembering that if you got everything you wanted right now at the moment you wanted it, then what's the point of living? Yeah. If you got everything you wanted, that would be like unlocking a video game. And what happens when you unlock a video game? You get bored. You can do anything. You blow a bill after a while, you're bored. That's what would happen. You get you get rich. You want to be rich? You're rich. Famous? Sure. Whatever. Then what? Then what? You unlock the game, right? So you, it's all about climbing a mountain, getting to the top. Victory. Look for the other mountain. Now go look at that mountain. Now go for that mountain. It's not about, like I said, the top. I'm going to brag about the top. I'm going to post it to everyone online. You mm-hmm. know, no. Boom. You did it for you. Take what you learned. Go to the next one. And that's a very hard mentality for people to do. Is It's just like you're going to upset people. And that's what David Goggins is talking about. You're yeah. going to hurt people along the way because they don't understand your passion and drive. And and that's the only thing keeping me going now. And, the, and not the only thing keeping me going, but it's what I realized keeps me going is that um, I was a child actor. I was a little monkey on a little string doing little tricks for people. And I realized I like being a little monkey, but I want to be in control of the strings. I want to entertain on my own account. I want to uh, do what I love just for me, not, not hurt it, you know, so um, – yeah, I so, can. Yeah, you know, I can. I can really resonate with that. And and something you said there reminds me of. I'm, I'm reading a book at the minute. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it called Atomic Habits by a guy named James mm. Clear. Uh, a very very good book. If you're if you're into the kind of David Goggins kind of thing, um, oh yeah, he he. Um, he basically outlines kind of a framework for just improving everyday life and and how. Uh, how basic it is, but also how difficult it is at the same time. Um, and it, kind of like what you said about, like, you know, if you had everything that you wanted right now, what would be the point in anything? And he, he breaks that down into the simplest forms of, like, um, you know, if there's a new movie coming out and I tell you the end result, then it removes a lot of the want to see the movie anymore. So, yeah, that's kind that's of, true. yeah, and, it, like, I do definitely get what you're saying. It's like, and, and I, I think social media uh, I, I really, in the last couple of years, have tried to reel myself out of that. Um, I've always been on social media for for podcasts and, and, and articles and different things like that. But I had also got personal accounts and I was getting so wrapped up in what everybody else was doing and everybody else had. And I never really focused on anything I was doing ever. And it would stop me maybe from doing things because 
Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if I'm going to do this and I can't make X amount of money or if somebody finds out I'm doing this thing for free because I love it, I'm going to look like a bum compared to X, Y, and Z or whatever. Uh, yeah. I just think that's no, something no, no. people I, need to address. It, it, it's a sh- Yeah, and it's a shame. And I think a lot of it comes from your high school days in a way or just like uh, wanting or not so much wanting to disappoint, but like, Oh, those kids are going to think I'm faking it. I, I didn't act like this in front of them. But the whole reality is ridiculous because you don't even talk to these people. Like, I have been struggling with posting my ticket stuff. And, like, you know, if I post these, I'm going to look like a loser in my crew. Uh, the, well, wow, Ryan, you're posting movie stubs on your Instagram? Yeah, friggin' loser. And then I realized, well, what the hell do I care if they don't like that? I want to do it to share to other people because if I, like, okay, Back to the Future is my favorite the trilogy is my favorite thing of all time. If somebody showed me Back to the Future movie stubs, dude, I would be freaking. I would. Yeah. Be, I would. Lo- I would love to see that. I think it's cool. Even going online looking, I would love to see that. So I'm like, maybe there's people that would think it's neat that I have, uh, you know, a movie that bombed drastically and that no one saw. You know, uh, that- I had like tweeted Jason Jason Biggs one time because I saw a ton of his movies. I, I was a biggest fan of his. I still am. Mm-hmm. But I saw movies that bombed like, at Boys and Girls and. And I tweeted him, this is like nine years ago, and I was like, does this creep you out? And he's like, I'm flattered, but yeah, it creeps me out a little bit. And it's just like kind of like the joke, and then people started writing me back ar- around the world saying, oh, I-, I can't believe you saw it at this time. Oh, I see you went to Lake Howell in Florida. Oh, yeah, you know, and people that were interested. And I, I'm i like, well, why am I not doing what I want to mm-hmm. do? All because of these people I met so many decades ago or whatever at this point that it really doesn't matter, and and that's you know, yeah, it's, it's still hard every day. Yeah, but. it's such a bizarre thing. And and instantly when you mentioned the ticket stubs, straight away I was like, oh, either start posting them immediately on your own account, make a new account straight away. It'll be huge. <laughs> like, so there's and you're right. There is there's so many people out there who love that. And if someone were to ask me, I think it's one thing for you to have this collection and and post about it for other people. But then even I would have that internal like oh, I need to see that, or, oh, look at this, let me look at this. And then I would kind of, like, look over my shoulder and go, like, if somebody saw me looking excitedly at somebody else's ticket stub, am I strange for doing this? Right. And no, not at all. I think they're more strange for, for critiquing you of being excited, whatever the hell that may be. And that's what we like. If it, if it makes us happy, it, it sparks a fire. F everybody else, mm-hmm. man. And that's my biggest thing now. And, and like I said, trying to find people that have that mind is very, very, very hard. Yeah. And I quickly, like, I'm always a nice person in the sense of I'll have a conversation. But if I find out that you're that kind of person, in the uh, overjudgmental, don't really care about humans, don't want to evolve mentally, um, I'll, I'll tap out pretty quick. You know, yeah. I won't be mean or anything, but you'll slowly see me disappear out of your life. Because uh, I don't want that negativity around me. And, uh, and most people shouldn't, you know. Yeah, I I think a, a lot of people just get caught in that that fishbowl and can just never get outside of it. Um, it's hard. You had mentioned uh, Back to the Future being your favorite franchise of all time. Yeah. What, oh my god! What is it about it's Back disgusting. to the Future? Um, I think it's so many layers, right? So when I was a kid, uh, it was in 1985. It came out. I was a couple years old. It showed on HBO. My mom taped it. Uh, I got, uh, it was like my fourth or fifth birthday, and this is on video also. Uh, I get a Michael Jackson cassette tape, and I open it up. My mom's like, who is that? And I'm like, ah, Michael J. Fox. And she's like, no. I'm like, Michael J. F- uh, Michael Jackson. She's like, yeah. And you hear her off camera, and she's like, who's Michael J. Fox, lady? And my mom's like, he's on that Family Ties show. Um, I tape Back to the Future for Ryan. He's just obsessed with it. He won't stop watching it. And that was, and then I had heard that. You know, I didn't know that's where the story came from. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice introduction to my obsession and uh, back to the future worked on so many levels growing up. Right. So like part two was just, not only was it colorful and there's flying cars kid, it's neat. You know, there's so many uh, writing uh, how things repeat back to themselves, you know, or noticing in part one that Tw- twin pines mall goes to Lone pines mall. And I never saw movies that actually did that where you mm-hmm. as a viewer were rewarded for paying attention. And you're like, Oh my gosh, look, that's different. And I literally, um, so back back when I was a kid, when I was like seven years old, they didn't have uh, the internet. You could download a movie script or or print one out. Mm-hmm. So I hand wrote Back to the Future one, uh, and I would play it, pause it, write it, play it, pause it to the point where I literally have it memorized 
from the beginning like nobody wants to watch it with me i'll have to be quiet when i do it but it will go right from the beginning where it's like the uh, uh october's inventory time so right now Staller toyota is making the best deals of the year in all 1985 model toyotas like it's a radio in the beginning like it's mm-hmm. disgusting how obsessed with the movie i was right and that led to um me wanting to do special effects with my camera it was such a a, a movie that worked on so many levels and not just it, growing up it evolved too like i hated three when i was a kid and i love part three now for the romance um i love two was my favorite of all time because it was the future and it was it, it was going back to the first movie i never saw that and then uh y- part one you realize it's an amazingly made movie for if you strip away what the hell it's actually about like i know it's a big joke now but it's the truth if i were to pitch it to a studio and say you know he goes back he kisses his mother he has like all the it's gonna sound mm-hmm. really weird yeah. um but it is so well done and it still holds up as one of the most feel-good films um so i think that had such a big impact on my life and i was short um, Michael J. Fox is short and we, I, I felt like I had a celebrity that was short. Uh, everyone in the industry was tall and that was a negative on my end, you know, in the sense of, Oh, he's too short for this part. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even know being short was a problem till later on in life. Not that it is, it's not, but it, you know, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So I, you know, back to future helped me just, I mean, it's the one thing to this day I'm still obsessed with. There's back to the future and Ninja Turtles um, and those were because they were before I got into acting and, uh, there's Bill and Ted and a couple others, little, little ones that I'm obsessed with because before I got into acting, that was a movie and I got lost in the fantasy of it. Once I started acting, I didn't realize how they were done and you could see them differently. Those mm-hmm. movies were still in my mind. Fantasy, like 2015 still hasn't happened yet. That's the future in my head. Like, 2015 even though it was six years ago like um it that was where it all it was just the best so that's still the i sold just about everything i'm almost a minimal minimalist now but the only things i've kept is all my back to the future stuff and turtles ninja turtles <laughs> and because it makes me feel great i'm a kid i'll still put it on repeats saturday morning and write and work on my movies because it makes me feel when i thought i was the happiest which i wasn't but i thought i was you know yeah, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Uh, something what you had mentioned several movies there, um, and I I've always been a big John Hughes fan. Um, movies like Hocus Pocus, Back to the Future, all uh, yeah, that was Mick Garris. Hocus Pocus was directed yeah. by Psycho Four, or it wasn't directed by him, but you know, yeah. he he played part in that, and I got to see the filming of part two and. Uh, mass which was super cool um part of it but go on sorry you know no, the, I, I love but i know what you're saying those yeah the, other films those those kind of I, I don't really know how to explain it i i think you had said like feel good movies and i would categorize all those kinds of movies within that and i've always felt like there was this magic from those era of movies and mm-hmm. I don't know, in modern times, don't get me wrong, I, I I still love film, I still love all kinds of movies, from comedy to rom-coms, anything. Um, but there's, I, I can't help but feel like there's some sort of um, magic that's been lost. Now, maybe it's just that's me gone. with nostalgia, but yeah, I no, feel like there's something I, I, lost. I think you're, you're right, because, that, so speaking of John Hughes, I actually hadn't seen a lot of his movies, and that was like flack I got from people when they're like, you never saw The Breakfast Club? you got to see it. And there's still quite a few I hadn't seen. Um, but I had seen some 80s films that I didn't enjoy, and I was like, oh, I should have seen that when I was a kid. And then other ones, I'm like, that was amazing. Mm-hmm. And there's still, to this day, if you watch horror films from the 90s and below, and 90s not even really touching it, but they're gross as hell, man. They'll look more realistic than the CGI. And I really wish they implemented both of them again. And the real reason they don't is because of money and, and it costs a lot of money to make those prosthetics. And, and a CGI is a much more convenient way of doing it, you know? Uh, but unfortunately it just, you just know your brain just knows something's off. Like I'll watch something and I'm like, there's something CGI about this. You don't know what it is and you'll realize it is, but I'll watch something from the, oh my god, I'm trying to think of what I just watched, and I, I'm like, those effects are better than today's. They make me feel grosser mm-hmm. and like disgusting than anything uh, now. And and yeah, I feel that is kind of a lost thing, as well as the um, the passion into it is you'll you'll get these Netflix horror films that just 
they just turn out yeah, like yeah. waxwork and they're just eh, they're almost there oh that was kind of good like you almost had it and then i feel that happens more often than not it's like when i see something good i'm more um surprised than you know I'm yeah, like, wow yeah, whoa, whoa. True. <laughs> that was really good yeah rare true you know, like um so uh, part of it is 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 um they need revenue they need money they need constant income so it's it there's such a field and i think that's why i'm more about recruiting people for my projects that are about the passion because once it's about the money it's about hurry up it's about the, yeah and ah uh, no because i don't care if nobody's see it's my movie it's me it's mine like that's the best part i want to be happy with my product and i ain't putting it out till i am but you should just like that you know and i you can get into the world like if you get into the entertainment world the corporate stuff you can do that too it just comes with other stuff that you have to be careful of mm -hmm. and when you get to do your own thing um and and it's out of pure love it just doesn't it just feels fun it's so fun and you can't really i personally can't work on a comedy when i'm depressed it's really hard to edit something funny when you're like with tears in your eyes you know yeah, so yeah. i only want to work when i'm in this great feeling and the whole point of the movie is to let others know you're not alone and life gets better and it's a good feel thing and that's all i'm about is um leaving something that may be thought-provoking and and um yeah you know it's it, funny it, yeah it already sounds like it's <laughs> gonna be um what are some of your uh, go to horror movies or otherwise you know movies that you'll revisit quite often so i know this is so like biased and it's psycho <laughs> and that was before i was in the movie okay just for the record no not that i like liked it i didn't really see any much horror when i was a kid but i knew of it mm -hmm. and when i had watched it after becoming in the movie and i'm like well let's see what's up what's going on with this movie and i was old enough it was so well done in the sense of like Anthony Perkins performance, so smooth and creepy. And I really loved it for the filmmaking. And I felt stupid for many years ever saying that because, Oh, well, whatever you were in part four. No, even if I wasn't, uh, it's still really great. But as far as my go-tos in, in like around Halloween time, mm -hmm. I definitely like those um, fun instant gratifications similar to Hocus Pocus. But like, I really like, um, uh, Dead Silence, yeah. which was oh. the the dummy one. I think Such it's a, a good movie. movie. Such it's a good so movie. It's so fun. Yeah, and 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 things like Idle Hands. I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw that, but it's yeah. like comedy horror. I'm biggest comedy horror fan, and so I really those are kind of my go tos as well as uh, I like compilations. There was a Boogeyman compilation. They only made one, and it just shows like kind of the highlight scenes of. Uh, it will go from like Chucky to Freddy to mm -hmm. Jason, all of them, and those are just fun. Um, uh, my go-to, I love all of the Friday 13th. They're so fun in, in almost every form. Those are definitely good. And at Halloween, I, I just really freaking love. And oh, but there's some more that I'm just not, I didn't prepare technically for the question in the sense of, I definitely have more. Yeah, I'd I imagine. With, you know, yeah. sitting there, they're just feel goods and. And I don't know about you, but I get bummed when Halloween's over. I'm like, yeah, I, I get a couple more weeks. I, I had a bit of that this year, and especially um, normally every September, late September, early October, I normally travel to Orlando and do Halloween Horror Nights and all Best. those different things. And like, you know, I haven't had it now in two years. I missed the 30th anniversary this year because obviously we, it was still on, but we couldn't travel to the States. Um, because Bummer. of the whole pandemic thing, um, yeah, and this year has just felt like it's been real, like uh, bummer, like a yeah. dud, like a, oh, I didn't really get to do. It. I felt the same. I was so busy. I love haunted houses, and I didn't get to do one this year, and I was really bummed. And it, those kind of things. So next year, I'm like, I'm gonna make sure. Well, I have a tradition now with my nephew. He's two years old, but I go up to Boston every Halloween now and spend it with him, and he's young. So I have something else to do, but this year I went there, we got to celebrate, but I didn't get my haunted houses. And when I lived in Orlando, um, and I also worked at Universal many years back, and uh, I went, I had went every single year to Horror Nights since 1992. I think that was the Crypt Keeper year. Oh no, that was 95. But either way, I, I obsessed, man. When you, oh, so you, remember how I said I have a bunch of Back to the Future stuff? The other stuff I got is Universal and Islands of Adventure and Halloween Horror Nights stuff because I was obsessed. Nothing still can top Horror Nights to this day. And I was spoiled rotten. You're, you're talking to somebody who can 
who I would say is equal on that. I, I have... The obsession I've had with Halloween Horror Nights, I felt like for a long time, I was like, nobody's ever going to rival this. And not in like a, oh, I'm the biggest fan in the world. It was like, nobody's ever going to get like how much I like this and why I like it. You can't see it right now, uh, but right in here alongside this Chucky doll in the background, um, I have, mm-hmm. it's like a one of 50 maybe. It's um, from the 20th anniversary. They had a character called Fear. And he had all the different icons, the caretaker, the yeah. director, Jack the Clown, these totems. And I have the the uh, replica sick. of them in a glass case. Um, I have, like, so much stuff. Every shirt for, like, the last, like, 12, Dude, 15 years. I would love to show you my stuff. Because you would, like, it, you would appreciate it or enjoy it. Because nobody else does. I don't have anyone that's yeah. a Horror Nights fan in that regard. Yeah. Uh, I, I kept every single, like, event calendar. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. All the coins that they used to throw in the parades. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I got so much crap I would love to show you. Uh, just because I have it sitting there. And then one day I'd like to display it. It's just in a bunch of boxes. That's something you should post as well. You wouldn't believe. Well, I, maybe you already know. The... Uh, the Horror Nights community is, like, wild. There are so many people that go crazy for that stuff. That's great to know. I did not know. On my Instagram, many while back, there's two coins from 1996, and that's when I started collecting them that I put up there. But um, it, I have so much stuff. Again, I used to be quite, you know, embarrassed of that. But Horror Nights, it, it was just it made you feel like you were in the movies and that was a rare feeling. And it was so well done that it was also again, rewarding to the viewer. You could see little set pieces and be like, that's amazing. And Mm -hmm. um, when I worked there, I got to go all the time every day for free. And it was my goodness, man, that was a really, really fun job. I wish I did that when I was um, like my whole teenage life. It was so great. Yeah. Very Um, few people seem to have a bad thing to say about it. Really? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, oh gosh. So fun. Yeah. And you, but growing in Orlando, you just get spoiled. You think every state is like that. And uh, once you move, you realize, oh, wow, I took that for granted. Yeah, because um, it's like a giant playground. Yeah, well, it was It was like, so not just was I obsessed with it like you were and stuff, but like they had psycho-themed <laughs> houses. And that was like when, when they would do that, or they used to have a Alfred Hitchcock like experience at universal that you mm-hmm. could go through. And at the time I had just done the movie or it was maybe, maybe a few years later. Uh, my mom would be like, he was psycho in the movie. And like, nobody would believe me. They're like, Oh sure, sure. But it was, it was such a surreal thing for Norman Bates to attack me in a bunch of ways <laughs> when I was Norman Bates going through them that it made an experience that was like, so meta. I was just like, this is, this is amazing. And, and, fell in love for obvious uh, a bunch of other reasons but you know i mean yeah do you do you have any my baby go ahead hmm? i was gonna say do you oh, have no, any Halloween traditions? because they filmed it there sorry that's the uh, uh psycho four had the house was there you yeah, know, yeah. I filmed yeah. It. it was originally on location so i was in the back lot of universe because when you weren't working and I was a kid, my mom would take me in. So Universal, and I did a lot of Disney commercials and, and TV shows that when you were working at Disney, I had a four-pass, you know, park hopper. I don't even think it was four parts back then. I think it was like two or three. But So mm-hmm. I was a spoiled little kid having no clue how great I had it in the sense of getting to go to all these theme parks when people around the world are literally saving their money planning for years for these trips and it's like a saturday for me and it wasn't until all that was stripped away where it's like wait and not every child uh, had this life uh <laughs> yeah. i didn't even know mine was interesting you know i thought i had the one of the most uh shame like i'd never told anyone because i thought i had the worst life like oh it's not going to sound cool at all not that it was cool but it would you know you just think that you can't live up to other people's lives yeah and yeah little did i know that was like the beginning of real world <laughs> like you know in the sense of just uh seeing everybody else's posts and and yeah as much as i try to get away from it it's good for your mentality but the catch 22 is it's really good for business and try to 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 spread yourself and if i do want to make these comedies and i have a bunch of shorts i want to post i would want other people to find it so by doing that you need to learn all the things that go with social media and you have to be part of it um, I'll see a ton of people get overnight success because they posted something. I mean, you'll see, it could be nobody that even is in the industry and all of a sudden they're on Ellen the next day, yeah. you know, be, and that's because they put themselves out there. And that's what it's about is that if I'm really 
passionate about finding people to collaborate that have the same mind, put myself out there and I will find that. And now it's just about being fearless and, and, you know, uh, 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 going for what you want, I guess, ultimately, you know? Yeah. To, to hear you mention, um, you know, you have shorts you want to post and stuff and instantly I, you know, I can think of all these different people who had shorts uh, that they were really passionate about and put them out and like they managed to blossom into these like, crazy huge deals and like e- even now so a lot of times you know you would hear those stories from maybe canada or the states i think it's even stretched worldwide now like you know we see um i don't know if you're familiar with the movie i think it came out in 2017 lights out oh yeah yeah and that sure. had originated y- yeah that had originated as a short um oh no kidding i didn't know that that's that, neat that movie that came out during the pandemic host it was all done through zoom mm, um, that's crazy i did not know that either yeah the and and that got like a, a lot of buzz and the uh the co-writer director and the producer for that movie have now signed up with blumhouse they have like a four picture deal with universal and it just seems wow. to I guess it, it seems overnight, obviously, much like yourself, you know, it's day in, day out, it's a constant battle, I'm sure. But to know that you can kind of, I guess that's the plus side of the, the whole social media, internet thing, that overnight you can have your 10-year success, just kind of like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, what, you know, the, the the peaking point, as well as literally somebody that just posted and went viral, no, not even trying, you know, in any form. and. And that's, you know, you throw the darts and you see what sticks. And that's where it really comes from now is putting your stuff out there. And unfortunately, I was a big perfectionist. And I think the perfectionism came from caring what people think, you know, yeah. where you didn't want to put it out there. Uh, and then I, I actually made an alias name. I made a whole, you know, fake name on Reddit. And I posted anonymously, you know, not as myself. Like, here's a, a short I did. And it got tons of hits and likes and comments and i'm like this is genuine you know i didn't you know because they don't know who i am in any form not that i'm anybody but just they're telling the truth you know the internet can be brutal and it felt so good to where it was like well i can start releasing stuff and and not feel so embarrassed um but i have also found that if i do a bit or i show a clip to my mother or father or something i will get a negative reaction maybe or i'll be like oh they don't find that funny but then if I perform it on stage and it gets a big reaction, I'm like, wait a minute, maybe I'm asking the wrong, like just, mm-hmm. you know, you find it funny. And that was the thing is like half the time my mom will be like, I don't get it. It's not funny. And I'm like, wow. And, but that's when you don't take the one critique. You just, if you really think it's good, keep trying it out. And if you get in laughs, tweak it up. Oh, uh, but yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, everybody has their place and everybody has their thing. I'm sure there's probably plenty of podcasts and different things that I consume that a lot of other people will be like, no, nah, I'm not really into that style or I'm not into that thing. And, you know, someone had put it to me before, like, you know, even the worst movie in the world is a lot of people's favorite movie. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, so it, and it really point. it really is subjective. Like it's it's one of those things where. Uh, And like you said, like, you know, we talked a lot about like maybe being ashamed of being into something and different things like that. And like you are right in the sense that like there is so many other people out there who are who do find that funny, who do have that same sense of humor, who who want more of that. And who I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, there's one time I would have said it, it sounds pathetic to say, but there's there was times where I would look forward to X podcasts, new episode or uh, another episode of a TV show or something. It was just like, uh, you know, it was just a little bit of time I could switch off, I could enjoy it, and it just helped. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, and I guess that's what it comes down to what helps you, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you want to influence the most in your life. Um, and first of all, I've been wanting to say this for a while. Your Myers collection is amazing. Your masks in the back. Yeah. How long did that take? I, I I actually have more. I have the part two mask here. Uh, over that side of the room, I have the one where he gets shot in the eyes, and then I recently Sick. picked up part four. He's how many years did it right take, there. or were they all pretty quickly? Yeah, it was one of those things where like I got one, I want more. Yeah, and it's just like it, like this room is like slowly starting to. I'm in an attic conversion, and like the room is slowly starting to like consume on it's top of me. Super sick already, and I only can see part of it. I mean, even that's the Candyman hook in the back, right? Yeah, it's yeah, hard the Candyman hook. Dark, but like, and then you've all got of that the. Is, um, what is that one? Um, Child's Play 2, 
when Chucky gets his face <gasps> oh melted off and it's the skull. That's sick. It's hard to see from here, but that is sick to have. There's uh, a that's uh, a leprechaun bust. I don't know if you're familiar with leprechaun. I just so that's what that's one every Halloween. Uh, leprechaun three is one I watch uh, in Las Vegas. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. that's such so a good funny. Yeah. Another one that's just like prosthetics. Mm-hmm. You, you saw, right? I mean, yeah, honestly, yeah. it's so well done. The chick that gets the lipo and the big butt. Yeah, it's so inventive, like all that stuff. And and I think maybe that's kind of what I was referring to. Those little things. And I think that's the one, isn't it, where he puts the, the pot of gold in the old guy's um, stomach? Is that that one? I don't know if that's part three. I just watched it, so three it's... It, it's one of them anyway. He he puts a the guy wishes to have the gold or something like that, and then he puts the pot of gold inside of him, in his side of stomach. Yeah, and he's like screaming and crying, and he's like, "Do you want to make another wish?" And he's like, "Yeah, I wish you'd take it out of me." He's like, "No problem." And he gets this like long sharp nail, and like cuts his stomach open, and then rips it, and like pulls the pot of gold. Out. Oh no no no! So well, I just bought the whole after seeing three again uh, every year. I'm like, I haven't seen all the newer mm-hmm. ones, so I bought the whole thing on Blu-ray. But that one definitely, if it wasn't three, I missed it. But I don't think it was. No, I'll have not. to revisit them. Um, I just bought it. Yeah, that That's a good one, actually. I've done a few, I, I, I think twice now I've done like a full uh, me and like a couple of friends. And we've sat down. Now everybody else kind of tapped out. They weren't as into it, I don't think, after the first one. But we watched the entire <sighs> franchise Series? back to oh. back. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, three was my favorite because of the humor and just the ridiculousness. And mm-hmm. um, it it's always baffles me that it was released right to video because I thought that was like a theater version of, of the press, you know, the way they made yeah. everything. Yeah. And But still, super sick you got that. I mean. So as regards, um, final few questions, I guess, before I, uh, no, you're before good. I let you go. Um, you had mentioned obviously having shorts and things like that. Um, and you said you enjoy things like you know, Leprechaun Tree, the, the kind of mix between the comedy and the satire and, and what it's about. Are any of your shorts that you currently have done or is do you have any intentions in the future to maybe do a, a horror comedy or a, something like that? If if I were to, and I do have some awesome stuff I wrote, uh, obviously I wrote it, so I think it's awesome, but I have some really neat ideas. Um, but comedy horror is like one of my favorites. Comedy is my number one, but comedy horror is number two. Because I love horror, mm-hmm. but there's such a fine line between cheese and funny with horror that it's always such a safe bet to go comedy horror. Because what you yeah. want to be scary that ends up being funny, it's cool. And if it's funny, yeah. it's scary, it's cool. <laughs> it's like a win-win. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, comedy horror, I would absolutely... I, I, I've done some stuff. It's, But yeah, that would definitely be a... a, a pipe dream wish list type thing because of what goes into a horror film with all the makeup blood mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff you know comedy's a little easier in regard of that you know and so going forward then into the future what what is your what is your vision for um the movie and these shorts and the comedy and different things like that is it is it something that you want to live on a youtube channel is it so I'm going to do uh, – so without getting too much into it, it's going to be like um, a hybrid thing where what's going to the movie is going to go to the movie. And what I can't use uh, will go to YouTube or maybe things I cut out. So there will be a whole lot of different little fun things that will be coming out because I can't use it all in the movie and some mm-hmm. stuff that – you know, if I just can't get the rights to, I can do it online for free. So, um, but there'll be kind of like a hybrid thing happening at the same time where it's kind of, if I can get it picked up for this TV series, if not, I'm just going to do it to YouTube. But like what it comes down to is, is making people laugh and smile. And if, if they want to continue to follow for those reasons, awesome. But um, I'm always open for everything. But like I said, it's got to be for, for the love and passion. It's not just for Mm -hmm. the money and Hey, you did something, help us do something. It's like, Oh, that's no fun. Then if there's no, um, payoff in, in, in that regard, cause I did all that and I get what people, you know, you got to hustle. This is more fun on the side. And I know a lot of comedians do not like people that go on stage just to fluff because they have a real, they're trying to build their career, Mm -hmm. but mine is not just doing fluff pieces where it's just like being ridiculous and stupid. It's, it's, just trying to interact with anybody, make them smile, make them laugh, change those chemicals for the better. And, uh, and, and if 
things happen because of that, so be it cool. But if not, um, I'm still uh, the happiest version of myself, and that's the ultimate goal. And everyone should just really love themselves. And and I'm still struggling, but it's getting better. I love that, and I love how um, I I love your mixture between the positivity, but also being grounded in reality. I think sometimes people can get caught up in. I I actually got got really caught up in this uh, a few years back where. Uh, I would look at all that stuff, all this positive and like affirmations and different things, but um, it wasn't actually doing anything for me. It was just like, it was mm-hmm. like this weird, like, um, I I would use that as a crutch to not actually do the work. If that gotcha. makes sense. I would like constantly yeah, yeah, yeah. take all this stuff in and be like, yeah, that's a, I need to do this and I need to do that. And then I would never really, I got in a cycle of like years of this going by and kind of, Maybe feeling like a little bit of a martyr or, or kind of being like, you know, woe is me. Sure. And I would oh, use yeah. that I mean, as like an excuse. Yeah. I mean, that's what they do. But that, that's, you know, goes back to just kind of finding the inner you mm-hmm. and not caring what anyone thinks of doing what you love for, for yourself and making sure that's what you're doing it for. And not just for yeah. whatever other reasons put in your head. Like, oh, you'll be famous. And it's like, well, okay, if I am what is that? What will that mean? Right. What maybe lack of privacy, more people will like me. Will I be happy? Will that make me happy? Mm, maybe, maybe, maybe not though. You know, so, um, never stop trying and keep, keep, uh, trying new things. I mean, that is, is always in. If you, and if you're a little bit of frightened, seek out people that can help, you know, seek out people online or, or other like-minded folks. And you can just about find any, at least one person nowadays somewhere yeah. online. Uh, it's just wanting to and and knowing that you're in uh, control and and go for it and never try, you know, just always try. There's no, you can't learn unless you try, you know. So I, I would say if I was to think back to, you know, I've seen so many different horror movies as I'm sure you have too. Um, I don't know why, but I always have this vivid memory of the first time I seen Blair Witch Project being absolutely terrified by the idea of it and i don't obviously it was something they'd done in the movie and it, it's still one of my favorite movies just for that and the lore they created and the, just the whole experience of how it was done um is there a movie other than obviously you had mentioned you know things like uh the tales from the crypt and stuff like that is there a any particular horror movie that sticks out in your mind maybe even you know a little bit later on when you weren't a kid that really got oh, the, you. The descent was the last yeah. one that I remember really making my mind think when I saw it in theaters. That was the last one, and I want to revisit it just to make sure it still holds up in that regard. But yeah, that was the last one that I, as an adult, was just like, "This is terrifying." Like, I'd hate to be down here in a cave with these albino vampire-looking things, um, you know, whatever it is. But that one for sure uh, was one of the probably the probably the last one as an adult. Yeah, I, I can I see think, that. But I, just to go, no, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, just to go back with the Blair Witch thing, um, I had seen it in Orlando in 99, uh, and it was at the Enzion Theater, and it was before anyone knew about it. And it was, they had done a whole online marketing thing about these people missing, and it was a real thing, and I was part of that. I believed it. When I saw it, you didn't think it was fake. It was real. It was scary. It was, it was the first, like, shaky cam, doc-style movie, and it was like, we thought it was real and it was, t- and I saw that movie more, mo- probably more than anything. I have all the stubs. I-, I know I saw it at least four or five times, which you would think somebody wouldn't because a lot of people thought it was boring, but I brought my grandparents to it. I brought my mom and dad. I thought it was the scariest, yeah. craziest movie because I didn't know what was going to happen. So my heart just keeps going the whole time. It was all in my head, but man, Blair Witch was definitely one that did that to me. But, but later in life, Descent was, was maybe the last one. And I'm still on that you know, challenge of get, mm-hmm. get, get me grossed out or discuss, like, you know, try it, send me some my way. I will definitely look at them. Uh, yeah. That's something I think I'm myself. always chasing as well. Um, I'm a huge uh, Blair, Witch is probably in my top five. It's something I always put on. Obviously I can never get back to that first initial feeling, but, um, oh, I, sure. I can always respect and appreciate like what it done. I actually have, um, a piece of the, the rust and power house, from the end of the movie Uh, that's cool um but uh i've gone completely off track now what i was talking about um 
The Descent, no, yeah. No, I totally understand. When, when, when you mentioned just... The Descent, there's another movie, actually, that's, before I forget, uh, a recommendation I have for you. Uh, it's a, I think it's an English-made movie, um, if you like The Descent. It's called Creep. It came out in 2004, I want to say. Okay, yeah. I don't uh, think it's I've set in the London that. Underground. Um, cool. Very Descent vibes. Go into it with no prior knowledge. Just look it up, get the stream or whatever, and just watch it. Don't look up anything. <laughs> Definitely, this is the best place. I don't even like trailers anymore. So wait, it was called Creep, right? Creep, yep. Yeah. Two, right. 2004, uh, I think it is. Um, very, very underrated. Very, very good movie. I, I'm actually cool. interested no, no, to see what, once you do get a chance to watch it. Uh, please let me know what you think. Definitely, absolutely, man. The minute I find it, I'll do it. Um, okay, so two final things. Is there anything you'd like to plug, promote, or anything that people can keep an eye on or check out now? Or is that all still kind of currently? It's definitely currently. Yeah, I wish I could tell a couple things, but mm-hmm. I got to wait till next year. Um, but it's all new stuff. It's all going to be me exploding with all the stuff I've been uh, working on the last few years. So I'm just kind of out of nowhere. It'll be like of stuff so nothing to plug yet because i feel like if i did it would be premature um but maybe hey next time let's do it and Mm -hmm. i would love to uh talk about right now um and one would be super fun to talk with you about so we should totally do that yeah 100 percent. i'm I'm down in the new year if you want to do it again um i I think people are really going to respond to to a lot of what you had to say um Final question that I ask everybody: um, Why, why horror or why movies, and what do they mean to you? Um, I guess kind of to to say earlier, movies were my way of experiencing the world without leaving my home. In a sense, you know, whether it was theaters or or, and I feel like I was more worldly, more cultured by watching those films. Uh, whether it was just horror, any every type of genre I really loved and it almost made me a better person because I could sort of relate to people if I saw a movie that was similar which sounds silly and ridiculous but but it was true and movies for me was the only way I could connect and when when I was growing up as a child actor like I said I didn't want to be on one side or the other so I, I really stopped talking about politics or religion but movies that was my in always I'd just be like have you seen any movies lately and they would at least say one in theaters or on video and I seen it i saw every movie you know in that sense i could Mm -hmm. strike up a combo um and and go go with it that way so movies for me made me discover who i was and and it took a really long time but because of movies i didn't i i followed one dream and it was wrong but also because of movies failing made me realize that i have a story to tell and i really would love to share it Mm-hmm. So that's where my whole wanting to give to others kind of comes from the experience of movie love and hand in hand in a way. What a, what a great answer. I always love hearing because um, it's something I think I might have said it earlier. Uh, you know, these movies, even something like Psycho 4, different things, they mean so many different things to so many different people. Uh, and some people use them for just pure fun. Some people use them to get through hard times. Some people use them to make them laugh, make them cry, whatever it might be. Um, it really is a unique way of exploring a lot of your inner workings and emotions and different things. Absolutely. And it's a venting way. You mm-hmm. you figure out who you are through the art. You know, you put out yeah. stuff and, and learn from it. It's super yeah. cool. And I can't wait to share some stuff with everybody. So soon sooner than later. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's the final thing we'll say then is uh, keep an eye out for next year at some point we will link up and do this again hopefully and um, absolutely it's been an absolute pleasure nice uh, first man it was great meeting you thank you so much for being so open and awesome and, and talking online and getting this going this is a lot of fun yeah this and my was first great. podcast man I had a blast that's I, I i'm gonna make sure to remember that so when you're appearing <laughs> on everyone's podcast from next year on and everybody's reaching out uh, to you i'll bring you up with me man kidding me and if it even gets to that may never and that's okay too but i really appreciate this is super fun man it gives a highlight of my week easily so uh, i can't wait likewise it's actually put me i was i was kind of in a a not so good mood coming into this and now i'm leaving this 
in a much better, more positive kind of go get him mood now. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah. And I like, you know, and if uh, I know it's, it's silly to say, but it's the truth. If you ever feel like you're down and, and, and you feel like you have no one to talk to reach out. Cause I say that with everybody and, and it seems silly, but you'll be surprised. You know, yeah. I always, I always got something to say that may help and it may not, but it's always worth reaching out because you never want to feel alone. And I would never, ever say anything, uh, to hurt your feelings deliberately. So with that being said too, if I don't get back to you online, if you wrote me a message or something, chances are I'm busy or I didn't see it. You know what I mean? And and that's always the truth. I'm very face value now because I don't like having to remember lies because then you got to remember, right? So I love telling the truth because it's the same answer every time. So it's, it's same kind of way. I I just, if, if you feel you're alone, reach out, it will never hurt. And that should go for Mm -hmm. everything. So that's great much appreciated like i said um let's do this again soon and um Definitely. yeah everybody keep an eye out um like ryan said there's there's currently nothing set in stone that i can direct you to right now but uh i i'll keep in close touch with ryan and as soon as there is something to announce we'll make sure to get the links everywhere well i know that sounds good man i appreciate it dude thanks so much thanks, man.